um, I would like to introduce Judy Geyer and Carolyn Cox and Kat Harden, our facilitators, who will introduce our, our course for today and our speaker for today. We hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone. As uh, Julianne said, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Judy Geyer. Um, and this course, Climate Change, What Does It Mean for Floridians, is a very timely topic. And our speaker today, Dr. Sadie Ryan, will address climate change and mosquito-borne illnesses. Uh, this course was originally offered last spring, but before we could even have one session, all ILR programs were canceled. I am grateful to Carolyn Cox, whom you will meet in a moment, and fellow Okamic resident Ellen Efros for their help in organizing this course, and to the speakers who weathered the year and are with us this spring to give their presentations. Carolyn is the coordinator of the Florida Climate Institute, a 10 university climate research consortium that includes UF, FSU, and many other major Florida universities. She has degrees in both science education and marketing, which helps her communicate the complex scientific information that she has to relay to the public. In her role as coordinator, she has helped develop several interdisciplinary research programs, launched experiential learning opportunities for students, managed large climate conferences, events, and established a network of collaborators in Florida and abroad. I've asked her to say a few words about the Florida Climate Institute before she introduces Dr. Ryan. Carolyn, welcome to Oak Hammock and thank you. You're on. Thank you, Judy. And thank you to the other organizers who made this possible. Um, Judy did a great job of summarizing what I do at the Florida Climate Institute. So we are an interdisciplinary research institute that includes 10 universities throughout the state of Florida. Um, and we do a lot of coordinating of large reach research proposals, events, outreach, communications, things like that. You can find more information at floridaclimateinstitute.org, which also includes a link to our climate book, which has 21 different chapters. I think Judy sent that out at some point um, on the ways that climate impacts various sectors throughout the state of Florida. So you don't need to buy the 700 page book, thankfully. <laughs> Um, so each chapter is a downloadable PDF at the website. So take a look at that and poke around the website and you will find out a lot more about what the Florida Climate Institute does. Um, I do have the great pleasure of introducing our first inaugural speaker in the series, Dr. Sadie Ryan. She is an associate professor in medical geography in the Department of Geography and in the Emerging Pathins, uh, Pathogens Institute at the University of Florida. And she is the PI of the Quantitative Disease Ecology and Conservation Lab Group. Her training is in ecology and evolutionary biology from Princeton with an emphasis on conservation biology, quantitative ecology, and particularly disease ecology. Her PhD work at UC Berkeley centered on the African buffalo spatial <laughs> ecology and their savanna environment in the context of an epidemic in bovine tuberculosis. Heavy stuff. So her research now is funded through multiple avenues, including the CDC, USAID, World Bank, NSF, NIH, and the DOD, supporting theoretical and applied research and training teams her team currently conducts research investigating the multi-scale issues of climate health relationships in and on landscapes and interactions with livelihoods, sustainability, parks management goals, the urban environment, and local perceptions. Her lab is the home of multiple projects in ecology at the human interface spanning socio-ecological systems of vector-borne and environmental disease ecology, climate health modeling, insecticide resistance, and wildlife conservation from Florida to the global tropics. So big, heavy topics for a super amazing person. So without any further ado, Dr. Sadie Ryan. Thank you very much for that introduction. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, and I must 
unfortunately give you a caveat um, about today's talk that I was in the middle of putting my slides together when my computer decided it needed rebooting. And so I didn't get to save the version that I was going to give you today. So I may be surprised by a couple of my slides um, in terms of what order they were in when they got saved, um, but we'll do the best we can. And it's really exciting to be here today um, to talk to you about this. I wish I could have put a bit more Florida content in here, but what I really do is think about things on a global scale, but then start to think about how we can bring these sort of large scale models of what we think is going to happen in the future back down to planning scales and to see if we can actually communicate the interesting science we do as something useful for planning. Um, and so you can see from this rather busy opening slide that I, I wear lots of hats, I have lots of affiliations, and that means I work across a lot of um, different agencies and people. And so it's really important to me to be able to communicate some of what we do, um, which is why it's ultra embarrassing that my slides may not be in order. Um, so let's see if I can actually advance the slides. So I wanted to give a very, very surface view of what we mean when we're talking about climate change, um, specifically because there's lots of acronyms that I tend to use and because this is not what I was trained in either. Um, and so in terms of thinking about sort of the atmospheric science that goes into describing climate change, there's this thing called radiative forcing. And we all know what this is. Um, it's basically the difference between the radiation that hits the earth as it comes down and that that's bounced back into space. And so it is measured as watts per meter squared. And we tend to think, so think of wattage in our light bulbs. So we sort of have a feel for what that might be. And so we can think of that as the energy that's sitting on the earth per meter squared, right? So what goes into this radiative forcing? Well, there's lots of things. We all know about greenhouse gases at this point. And so those give sort of a positive net radiative forcing. And so that's things like CO2 emissions, things like agricultural emissions. Um, and we know that those occur and happen to go up and down in the atmosphere depending on different factors. I'm not gonna go deep into this. I'm not an atmospheric chemist, so you don't need that lesson today. There's also things that decrease radiative forcing, things like reflecting off of snow, for example, um, and direct effects. The, the radiation just bounces right off the surface. And so what we have on the very far right of this chart is basically what is the net anthropogenic component, so what it is that we are contributing to that radiative forcing in terms of all the things that go into what happens. Um, and so if we think about climate change, it sort of contributes to both warming and weirding. And in Florida, we're really very conscious of experiencing climate weirding. And what I mean is that we get things like dramatic events in climate, and we see the impacts of those dramatic events on the landscape. However, the backdrop of this is a gentle warming that's happening, and it's maybe not so gentle. Um, and so some of the acronyms that we get are describing what we think will happen in the future in terms of how what we do now or in the future will impact that climate change, right? And so that atmospheric chemistry that happens. And so I've just pulled here a graph for everyone to stare at um, from the Climate Impact Lab, which is a really nice website. I suggest you go and look at it because you can play around with looking at what's expected to happen in terms of Florida's climate in the future. Things like how many days over 90 degrees are we going to be encountering? How long is the summer gonna be and how they're defining summer? Um, these are sort of the, the things that are used as tools to describe what we might actually experience in terms of the climate. But when we talk about these giant climate models that I use to attach some of this mosquito-borne disease work to, we think about these scenarios. And these scenarios are called representative concentration pathways under the current way of thinking through IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change. Um, and basically there are these narrative scenarios saying, what are we going to do for mitigation or not mitigation? And so the biggest one of these is 8.5. And this is also sometimes called business as usual. This is our worst case scenario. We don't do anything, emissions continue, and we get warmer. And so what we see with that is that it's predicted by 2100 that we are going to see greater than 8.5 watts per meter squared, that radiative forcing measure. And so that's been given this label of 8.5, which has a narrative that goes with it about us not doing emissions mitigation. This is the kind of way that we build these models um, and that atmospheric chemists can take these narratives about what we think we can do or not do 
in order to predict what the temperature outcomes on the landscape might be, what the different ways that precipitation may change might be. 4.5 is the sort of slightly more optimistic one where we start to do something and we stabilize the climate at about 4.5 watts per meter squared by 2100. And what you can see in this chart is what is expected to happen with these different scenarios under models of climate in Florida over time. And so what we see is over the next 50 years or so, under that 8.5, the business as usual worst case scenario, the average temperature in Florida, and so think about how big Florida is, right? Huge state, lots of different climates that we could be experiencing because we go to different ecosystems. Think about, you know, hanging out in Jacksonville versus hanging out in Miami. Something called an average temperature is a very strange metric. Think about what different temperatures happen at different times of years. But we still smush this all into one average temperature. And we say, what is that average temperature? It's in the 70s, right? <laughs> so this is something we can relate to. And basically what we're seeing is it's probably going to, on average, increase all the way up to sort of 76, 77 degrees under that worst case scenario. And somewhere around 73 in the less bad case scenario where we actually stabilize something. And so I'm trying to sort of anchor you onto these two because this is what, hopefully if my slides are right, we will be seeing again during this talk. So that was our, our atmospheric chemistry lesson. Now we're gonna have a very small biology lesson in which I ask you, how does temperature drive biological processes? And this is where we get into my mosquito-borne disease modeling questions. And essentially what I'm showing you here is what we call a thermal performance curve. And so that says we are all made of a bag of chemicals. Chemicals make enzymes, enzymes make proteins. This is sort of you know basic biology that builds up life. And so when we have biological processes, in a mosquito, things like biting and growing, things like laying eggs, things like the larvae developing so they can hatch out as adults. We have these things called performance curves and that's the rate at which that happens as a function of temperature. And so what we see on the left is this minimum temperature. Nothing's happening, it's too cold. Nothing's starting, no mosquito life is starting. But as we raise that temperature, so we go from left to right along the graph, we see that the reactions and the chemicals speed up with temperature and so do those rates of these processes happening until we get to this optimum temperature, this TO as it's called, optimum temperature. And then suddenly everything breaks down rather rapidly as we get to this maximum temperature above which nothing can happen. So you think that's the proteins literally cooking. And so we have these nice boundaries of temperature on these processes. But as we see, they're right bumped because things want to get up to an optimum pace. They want to go as fast as they can. Life will find a way. Um, but they fall off pretty rapidly after that. So you get this very interesting right-shaped curve. And so a question we asked a long time ago was, can we use this to inform us about vector-borne diseases, particularly? So malaria is a febrile disease caused by a plasmodium, um, and it's transmitted by Anopheles mosquitoes. It's estimated there are more than 400,000 deaths from, from malaria a year. And most of these cases on the globe occur in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is a disease that disproportionately affects children under five. We've had massive global efforts to curb malaria. Bed net distribution is a big one that has been very, very successful. Um, household surveys tell us about how people are doing mosquito mitigation, thinking about improving testing for malaria and treating malaria. And this has all reduced death rates worldwide. This massive global effort seemed to stall a bit in 2017. And there was this rise of about 3.5 million new cases in the 10 highest burden African countries. And so these questions from the global agencies taking care of this, um, one huge agency is USAID, the USAID, the President's Malaria Initiative. They distribute a lot of the bed nets around the world. We've also seen the Gates Foundation take a huge role in this. And so this stalling out of, of continuing to decrease death rates and decrease burdens was of great concern. I can tell you that it has sort of taken another turn back in the positive direction now. Um, but the big question of knowing where to invest to get those next few cases you know, reduced and when in the year is vitally important. And so that's where some of my mapping efforts come in. Another big disease that I'll be mentioning quite a bit is dengue. Dengue is a febrile disease caused by infection with the dengue virus. It is transmitted by Aedes mosquitoes. And I know that some of you are aware that Aedes mosquitoes are 
here in Florida and that a brand new one has just been identified as already here in Florida and established, which is a transmitter of these diseases I'll be talking about. Um, and so this is definitely an issue that is here in Florida. Around the world, there are about four serotypes of dengue virus. And one of the complications of having dengue virus is it can progress to dengue hemorrhagic fever, which if you know that Ebola is hemorrhagic fever, you can imagine how severe that could be. Primarily, it is a cause of morbidity. So people get it, they can't go to work, they can't continue to you know, sort of operate in the labor force. And so it tends to have big impacts on countries' GDPs, so their economics, rather than being a high cause of mortality. However, death is a possible complication of it. So in about 2008, the WHO said of around 100 countries at risk around the world, about 2.5 billion people. And in a normal year, there should be about 500 to 100 million cases, which is a lot. Um, dengue has no widely available vaccine. There's a lot of vaccine work being done. There is no cure. There's treatment, and then you get past it if you do. Um, and so vector control is really the best option for dengue. And so that is the primarily role, primary uh, intervention that we have. Aedes are container breeders. They love the urban environment. There are dengue cases in Florida in 2020. I haven't seen the 2021 numbers yet. There's also the added issue with Aedes mosquitoes of Zika and chikungunya. And so this is just a quick slide to show over the past few years that we've had arboviral diseases. Arboviral means a virus transmitted by one of these vectors. Um, and arboviral can also include tick-borne diseases, which is why I'm being careful not to just say mosquito-borne viruses. Um, but so what you can see is that we've had dengue cases, you know, a few dengue cases over the past decade. We've had a Zika outbreak that everybody should probably remembers. Um, we've also had West Nile virus bubbling along, and that's sort of up, had a little uptick in the past year. And so these flabby viruses, these particular viruses that are transmitted by 80s mosquitoes, are an ongoing cause of concern in Florida. Um, and so we are essentially you know, facing these tropical diseases. So I'm going to introduce you quickly to a model of malaria that we then use to think about 80s mosquitoes and to think about how we can map these usefully across the world and think about how we couple that to climate change models and how that then jams itself onto decisions that people can make to think about intervention. And so a long time ago, a group of us got together to ask this question, is a warmer world necessarily a sicker world? And I know this is a, a busy slide, but if we look at how malaria might respond to temperature, the reason why I was talking to you about mosquitoes and temperature is that if we look at this cycle of how a mosquito bites someone, it sucks up the parasites, those parasites develop in the gut wall in the mosquito, and then the mosquito injects those parasites back into the next human, all of that is taking place in the environment, not inside a human. And so these mosquitoes and the bugs developing inside them are exquisitely sensitive to environmental temperature. And so understanding that piece of this life cycle of the disease is incredibly important to thinking about where it might get to in the environment. So we've already seen this slide. This is where we realized my slides are a bit jammy. Um, but one thing that we noticed was that before we thought about this question of what happens with these right-shaped curves, Everyone had been using these straightforward rates, these just linear rates. As it gets hotter, it gets worse. So we said, what happens if we use these curved rates? You know, can we measure it? So we went to the literature, we pulled out these lab-based data, we fit these responses with these curve-shaped equations, and then we put these back into a transmission equation, this R0, which is the number of new infections from an infection in a naive population, versus temperature. And then we wanted to make sure really showed itself in the field. So we went to the literature, we pulled these out from malaria, we put them into a curve, and we found that the optimal temperature was around 25 degrees Celsius, which was about six degrees Celsius cooler than the previous estimate of the optimal temperature had been. So we thought, oh, did we do something wrong or is this actually correct? Um, and so when we went to 40 years worth of field studies on malaria and took the temperature at the month that each of those studies was done, and put that onto our graphs, we saw that in fact, most of those sat under our new, newly estimated curve for temperature response. And so that was sort of a big deal for malaria world. 
but so then the question became, how do we tell people about this? And, you know, we sort of put our heads together and said, well, people like maps, right? And so the question of where is really important for control. Where am I going to get malaria? If you're a traveler and you're traveling somewhere, am I going to see malaria there? If we're thinking in a climate change scenario, how do we anticipate the shift of transmissibility in different malaria seasons? So I won't go into the details on that one, but I basically chopped up the curves to say, where are we going to see this? And so this was the first attempt at this mapping, which is to take the entire continent of Africa and say, for any given place, given a monthly temperature, where are we likely to see that transmission? And so the dark red ones are where it's too hot in a given month, and the dark blue is where it's too cold, and somewhere in the middle is that Goldilocks perfect just right. And so we can see that as we march through the months, we see the different ranges of where it's better or worse for transmission, given a temperature, throughout the continent. So this started to tell us something about there being these sort of geographic patterns to it. When we compared it to the old estimates, we saw the old estimates said that most of Africa was too cold for malaria most of the time. And so in this piece of work, which was in 2015, we were still in old scenario descriptions for climate. So the IPCC was still using a different way of describing these, but we took a moderate scenario for thinking about future climate. And when we overlaid this onto population density, what we saw was this interesting phenomenon where the highest risk of the longest season for the most people sort of walks itself across the continent with climate change and ends up over East Africa from a current hotspot in West Africa. And so this actually sort of gave us a slight inkling that this was a useful way to talk about how climate change might interact with mosquito-borne diseases and people with climate change. It hit the news, people liked it. And so we thought, okay, let's do dengue next. <laughs> so we did the same approach again. We got the, the responses out of the literature. We put it back into this transmission curve and we wanted to validate this with field data. And we were doing this right as Zika hit. And so we ended up with these two curves because we have two different vectors of this disease. So two different mosquitoes. We've got Aedes albopictus, which is that tiger mosquito and Aedes aegypti, which is the classic yellow fever mosquito. We also ran into three different diseases. So as I said, we had chikungunya and Zika showing up at the same time. What we didn't have was a lot of field work on chikungunya and Zika to validate these models. So instead, what we did is used human case data and geolocated that to where these reports were coming out from the Pan American Health Organization at the time. We were also dealing with a brand new continent and different mosquitoes have slightly different ways they behave in the landscape. And so trying to think about where Aedes mosquitoes occur was worth, worth thinking about and considering. And so we made these maps. Um, and so what we see here is the intensity of red on this map is how many months of the year is a location thermally suitable for transmission by each of these different mosquitoes. And so I want you to notice that on these two curves, the paler one is that Aedes albopictus, and it is transmitting at a lower temperature, just slightly lower in its optimum. And Aedes aegypti is transmitting at this higher temperature. So the yellow fever mosquito is occurring, is, is doing its best transmission at these higher temperatures. And so what that translates to on a map, in the current climate, what we see is that that Aedes aegypti on the right, we see that 12 months of suitability happening throughout that South American range that we know is very, you know, very high in dengue. For albopictus, we see that some of that environment is just not quite in the right temperature zone for it. And so it's sort of got that broken up distribution in South America, but because Aegis albopictus can transmit at lower temperatures, we see that its range of potential transmission suitability actually extends quite, quite far north. And so we start to see these different geographic patterns of risk emerging. At the same time as we were looking at this, um, lots of people use lots of different mapping approaches to talk about Zika. One person put Zika and dengue data into the same model and found out that different maps of suitability resulted. And so I want you to pin that idea because I will come back to it. So around this time, USAID called me and they said, we want you to help us by helping us make some maps 
to help do our planning. And this is talking back about malaria. And so they said, we read your paper from 2015. We like the way you talk about these models. Can you rerun this with our climate models that we've made in-house to think about how we do our decision-making? And so of course my, you know, my question was, what are the decisions you can make and what are the estimates you use to do this? Um, and they said, you know, this is the report you're going to write. And so it was sort of much more prescriptive than we usually do science. Um, and so it was very interesting to be put into this decision-making framework to think about how to couple our models to the kinds of decisions they make. And so the first thing was, hey, this is a regional approach, right? So we're looking at Sub-Saharan Africa and we're breaking this into different regional decision-making pieces. Um, and so the question then becomes, you know, what's happening in Western Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southern Africa? Can we think of this in a regional way? They also base their decision-making for different ways of allocating resources based on whether the prediction is for endemic, so year-round transmission of malaria, and their definition of seasonal was something we had to look into, you know, all of the back reports about who decides how long a season is. And so we landed on these definitions of seasonal being seven to nine months and endemic being 10 to 12 months. And there you see the USAID colors, the blue and red, they, they really like their colors. Um, and so, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a tiny bit on this. And so what you see when we put these two on the map to say where are these, you know, where are these different lengths of season occurring, it looks like, oh, Central Africa is at the biggest risk. And so we would expect that that would be the region that would pop up as needing the most resources. However, this is where coupling geography to demography starts to matter. And what we see is that when we talk about people at risk, this thing called PAR, we see that in fact, those highly dense populations are in Western Africa and that the, what looks like a small amount of geographic risk actually translate to a lot of people risk. And so as we start to think about this sort of geographic and demographic matchup, um, we see that the way, the way that we couple this to decision-making frameworks really matters in terms of demography, so where people are. So as we push this through our, our magic climate machine, um, it's not a magic climate machine, it's a lot of code. I just sit there with my computer um, playing with giant rasters of data, so big grids of global data and their big climate models that are projected onto landscapes. What we're seeing here is that RCP 4.5 on the top, that lower, the lower risk mitigation scenario where we actually do some mitigation. And then on the bottom is that 8.5 or business as usual. And what we've done here is taken the 12 month risk, that endemic risk, and we're pushing it through different time frames. And what is striking about this is number one, we look at that number on the left, the number of people, that's millions, all those zeros. And then what we see on the far right is that Western Africa drops off fairly suddenly. And what that is, is that Western Africa gets too hot for optimal malaria transmission. And that is kind of an unexpected result. Um, it doesn't say take away all the resources, but what it says is that Western Africa is going to experience temperatures too hot for malaria, which is kind of interesting and rather alarming. And what we see is that Eastern Africa is going to have those highest burden populations in terms of risk of malaria transmission. When we look at the seasonal numbers, we see very similar patterns where Western Africa just rapidly drops off as the climate gets too hot for that optimal transmission. And I think I may skip another slide here, yes. So one of the questions they also wanted to know was where are the new areas that we should be thinking about putting resources? And so we mapped simply, where are the new areas that will have year-round transmission in these different climate change scenarios? And this is where we really starkly see that regional, regionalization of the issue, where Eastern Africa has the biggest new demographic burden. So I'm going to skip back again. <laughs> Sorry about all the jumping around um, with these slides. So when we look at our two vectors for dengue, we wanted to think about sort of how do we capture that issue of this geography and demography on the world. And so we made these rainbow maps that everybody loves, right? That is how many months of the year is an area suitable in terms of transmission temperatures for transmission by these two mosquitoes 
for dengue under these different climate change scenarios. And you'll notice that the RCP number in the middle of this graph is really low. Um, this is our most optimistic representative concentration pathway. Most planning no longer uses this because they don't think we can get there. Um, I still have hope that we could. But so if we look at these pictures, they're very nice, but they are really hard to interpret. And so what we wanted to do is couple this to demography as well. And it's really nice when some of your favorite climate reporters get hold of your work and say, oh, let's chat about this. So it's nice. Um, so I mentioned that it's important to know about your mosquitoes. So these are 80s mosquitoes and 80s mosquitoes are container breeders. This is urban risk. And we've discovered that in a lot of cases in our work in Ecuador, dating back a decade, um, that when we start to look at that sub-city effects of who is going to get bitten, a lot of what determines where these mosquitoes can live is all about human behavior. And it's about whether you keep containers, whether you keep trash. And so you guys have all seen about tip and toss and make sure your area around your house doesn't have mosquito breeding habitat. This is just pronounced over and over again across the world. So I'm really glad that we had very strong educational outreach during the Zika um, outbreak here to talk about tip and toss and tell people about you know, what, what the breeding containers are around a house. Um, and I hope that that message continues. So we looked at how many billions of people are at risk for how many months of the year across the globe from these two mosquitoes. And when we coupled this to climate change models, we realized that there are lots of different types of global circulation models out there. Different climate centers have different models. And so the height of these bars is the range of predictions given by the different atmospheric models created by the different climate centers. And going across each of these graphs in each little chunk are the different RCPs, those representative concentration pathways. On the top layers of these two graphs, we have 2050. On the bottom, we have 2080, as in those different time horizons. And on the left of each, we have that hotter 80s Aegypti. And on the right, we have the cooler 80s Albopictus. And what we're seeing here is on the left, we're talking about any transmission, so one or more months. And on the right, we're talking about that year-round transmission. And what you'll see is that for many people around the world, 80s albopictus risk starts to decrease at the 12 month level because it's too hot for 80s albopictus optimal transmission. But what we see for a little bit of the year or all the way up to 11 months of the year, so this left hand graph, is that any climate change scenario increases the people at risk. And so we start to get weird mixed messages with graphs like the one on the right, because do we mitigate for 80s Egypti mosquitoes, or do we not worry so much about Albopictus mosquitoes? So these are the ways that it becomes complicated to um, describe things. There's also the global burden of disease regions approach, where different regions of the globe are prioritized for health issues, and we like to describe them in these regional ways. Um, this is not an interesting table, but it is a really good talking point for decision makers. And it allows us to just say which of these regions are going to be impacted the most in terms of that demographic risk under these different scenarios by these different vectors. What some of you may be picking up on is that we're seeing a shift in Africa between malaria risk and dengue risk. And we recently looked at this to ask the question, is dengue actually there where we think malaria is? just hiding as a different illness. And colleagues um, in Kenya, so as you can see on the right, have looked at this question of things that show up as malaria under these different temperatures that are probably that test as not malaria. And so there's this thought that there's more dengue than thought previously. And so there are these non-malarial febrile illnesses that may be better suited for transmission in these places. Um, and so as we keep thinking about this question of translating maps into to sort of actionable risk for policy decisions, it's always good to look at what reporters pick up on. And people like big numbers. Um, so, you know, exposing a billion more people to bug-borne diseases is CNN's tagline for our work. Uh, mosquito spread may endanger millions in new places. Um, I think it's, it's 
I mean, it's always exciting to see your work picked up in the media, but it's also not always great just to have these alarm messages. Um, it's a very, it's a very good sort of way to campaign for mitigation, but it also doesn't give us this sort of pinpoint way of dealing with planning. Um, so one thing I mentioned earlier was this idea that Zika is not the same as dengue. And colleagues went back to the lab and they infected mosquitoes with dengue and with Zika, and then looked at those temperature curves. And what we saw is that Zika starts transmitting it a little warmer. And so I said, I'd like to see that on a map. And so what we see is that the range for Zika that's on the left versus the range for dengue is a little bit different when we put it on a map. Um, and so I, you know, I said, yikes, because everybody had been using dengue models to talk about Zika. And so I thought it was, I thought it was you know, interesting to think about this on a map. And then bringing this work forward into our questions about how we talk about Zika and exposure, um, we've all seen that Zika has, has dropped off in uh, profile and in cases. Um, and part of that is this population immunity that we think has happened. So this antibody or enhancement that we think has taken place. And so one question is what happens in a generation when we might have a new naive population and Zika could reappear. And so we explored this for the world, thinking about that sort of one generation time um, in 2050 under these different climate scenarios. And so, you know, we've got our rainbow maps again. They look a little more raggedy than they did for, you know, dengue because that, that Zika curve is a bit more constrained by temperature. And that's great, right? That's, it's good to know that less people are exposed to this potential for Zika transmission. When we look at 2050, we see that classic sort of poleward move, so things get more north. Um, we see that the, the, the warmer places appear to have more months of the year um, suitable, and so we're seeing that sort of expansion in the geography. But when we start coupling this to thinking about it in this global burden of disease regional context, what we're seeing is that with mitigation, so that 4.5, North America experiences the biggest increase in new exposures, whereas without mitigation, once again, we're seeing that Eastern Sub-Saharan Africa being having that highest burden of potential new exposures. And so we can start to regionalize our findings in this way. And this has potential for use you know, at much smaller scales, like thinking about Florida itself and where we're going to see different ranges of the seasons for these different arboviruses showing up. So I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do that. Um, so I think I'm going to pause here and allow for questions. I think, I, I think that was a good time, yes? Am I, am I on time for that? I don't know if anyone wants to give me a thumbs up or a, a yes. Julianne, can you respond to that? Is that okay? Um, well, I don't see any questions. It's, it's your call. Um, audience here, if you have any questions, you can go to the microphone. Um, There's the one item in chat. All right. I'll happily look at chat. I'm sorry, because Sadie, I'm because I'm not at my other home computer. I can't see it. So can you see it? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not seeing a question in chat. It might have gone to someone else. Um, okay. Okay. But I'm I'm happy to open open the floor to any questions from anyone at this point. Eli Glazer has a hand up. Go ahead, Eli. Hi, uh, Sadie. What is the status of the use of creating species of mosquito? that cannot reproduce, sort of like the creation of the mRNA vaccine. So are you talking about the sterile mosquito releases? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I, know that, I know that people have uh, done that, and there's been varying successes with it worldwide. Um, it is, I think it's a, I think scientifically and sort of theoretically, it's a, a really nice approach um, to sort of drive down a population of mosquitoes rapidly. Uh, I know that I know the concerns that are raised with doing that are that it costs a heck of a lot to screen and create the mosquitoes to do the release. Um, so it's not always, you know, obviously there's going to be an, an equity issue that's raised there with different 
different locations and vector control districts being able to afford it or not afford it. Um, I don't know if that answers your question at all. It's not my it's not my field of expertise. Of course, the uh, the issue is: is it, is it cheaper to force climate to change, or is it easier to get rid of the mosquitoes that do the damage? Well, that's a great question, and I mean, part of part of what comes into these questions as well is that these mosquitoes and the pathogens are all invaders, right? And so, you know, the invasive the invasive challenge faces us as well of how do we even prevent introductions of things that will be successful? So. You know, Aedes aegypti showed up probably about 300 years ago. Aedes albopictus, they think, came over in a tire shipment in the 90s. Um, and there's there's questions about whether albopictus establishes better than aegypti, and they transmit all kinds of different diseases. And then most recently, that uh, Aedes scapularis has been identified as yet another species of Aedes that's probably been here a while, but we didn't look for it necessarily. Um, and it's, you know, happily, happily establishing and, and has, has a, uh, a perspective range that people have mapped already. Um, and so, you know, there's the question of, you know, is, is mitigating climate change the way to do vector control? That's a money question, right? Um, but is it worth thinking about the added risks that we see with climate change that are brought to us by, you know, increasing potential for vectors? And, and vector-borne diseases. I have a, um, a uh, item here in chat from Anne-Marie Rizzo. Before I read it, let me say that, uh, how about if there, well, if there are more questions, we'll go for another three minutes and then we'll have you go back to your lecture so that we don't end up spending all the time on questions and have a difficult time finishing up your lecture. Oh, okay. I'm happy to be finished with the lecture since I would, I could talk for days, but oh, I thought, oh, it, was on, I thought okay. it was on a 40 minute timer. <laughs> okay, okay, then then fine, we'll go ahead. This is from Anne Marie. She says, having taught public policy for many years, I would like to know what challenges you faced in trying to translate your research findings into an applied form for later government action. Wow, that's, that's a really fantastic question. And thank you so much for it. Um, I. I try to do my best to think about how to, as a scientist, get into the room where decisions are made. And I think um, there, there's a great number of challenges. One is that you know the training I have doesn't train you to do this, and that's you know that's a, a sort of a classic issue with being you know in academia doing the kinds of science that people outside academia would want to access, and just not being able to close that gap very easily. Um, I think that we've made leaps and bounds in helping to get the message of the applied back into the classroom so that people are thinking about how they can do more of this outreach, more of this reaching across, you know, even outside academia, reaching across disciplines. Um, one challenge I certainly had was when USAID called and said, we want to, you know, we want you to do your stuff. I sort of, you know, I took a very scientist approach and said, oh, that's great. There's lots of uncertainties we'd like to explore. And they said, no, no, we want to, you know, do the thing and make the decision. And that was really challenging for me to think about sort of how can I best inform the decision itself while retaining the scientific credibility, you know, and making sure that it was understood how the models were actually expressing, you know, a form of risk that is not directly translatable to this will happen, right? So it's saying, you know, there's a risk and a potential rather than simply saying, you know, here's, here's exactly how many people will catch this because human behavior is, is never going to be entirely modelable on landscapes. Um, and so thinking about that and also thinking about the, the learning differences, I will say, between people in the decision sphere who are very familiar with policy language, who completely understand the law and decisions and sort of what decision making optimization is about, who may not have had a biological background. And, you know, if I come in saying this is really exciting because these mosquitoes do this and that, and we found eggs over here, that's not relevant to what they're doing, but being able to bring them along the journey of learning and put it in terms they can grasp onto is really important. Um, I could go on for days about this, so I will, I will stop there, but happily take more questions if you want me to um, be more specific. I have a question. 
Yes. Okay. Um, I, I guess one of the- I can't I see can... which person this is. Okay, this, this is, is Richard. 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 Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, uh, when I looked at the, uh, uh, the maps, um, I, I thought that the Southern Hemisphere, um, uh, which includes uh, a lot of the African sections, but also uh, a lot of Brazil, um, so I, I thought that uh, if we did it north versus south, um, uh, the southern exposure was uh, a more risky exposure um, to mosquito issues uh, like the, uh, Brazil and Africa versus North America and, and China. Um, and, and I am kind of curious about uh, since the temperature change uh, or the temperatures um, are relative the same at the same degrees of north latitude and south latitude, um, why, why is uh, the southern hemispheres uh, tend to have more uh, kind of We lost you there, Richard. I think you muted yourself. Uh, I guess what I'm, I, I'm sorry. Uh, That's when I, I, I'll be quick, uh, quicker. <laughs> uh, when I looked at the southern hemispheres of uh, South America and uh, South uh, uh, Europe uh, versus the northern hemispheres, it seemed like the incidence of mosquito diseases was greater in the southern hemispheres than in the northern hemispheres uh, at the same uh, at the same temperature. Um, in other words, uh, uh, and I wondered why that was so because uh, I would assume the temperature ranges of the northern is just out of seasonal phase with each other according to the calendar, but they both exhibit the, the temperature ranges that you measured. So am I mistaken about uh, that this tends to be a, a more southern uh, hemisphere issue than a northern hemisphere issue. And why is that? So your, your question is intersecting a couple of different facets. Um, one is that the global south obviously contains a lot of countries that are in these optimal transmission areas and which do not have resources the way we do to tackle the problem. And so when you said incidents, um, it made me immediately think of that sort of global south disparity issue that we see that is rife across the neglected tropical diseases. Um, much of the US was suitable for and indeed had malaria until quite recently in history. And we just did enormous amounts of efforts to rid ourselves of it. Europe did that you know, three or 400 years beforehand. Rome was really good at dealing with malaria, even though it didn't know that's what it was doing all the time, it didn't really understand how it was manipulating the biology. And so, you know, we've sort of, we have a historic reflection in that picture of the world. We also tend to project maps strangely, um, such that what appears to be a lot of South is actually a bit more North than we think. Um, and I, I won't go deeply into sort of the, the historic, <laughs> The historic view of mapping, um, but let's just say that inequity is also in there. Um, in terms of thinking about sort of why, why we see things at different latitudes with their temperatures, a lot of it is also about habitat, not just humans on landscapes. And so those temperature bounds, you know, can occur on an urban landscape and therefore have quite high risk for people because there are people there or they could be in a forested landscape where the population is pretty sparse. Um, and so our risk would look a bit lower in terms of sort of population density and temperature, temperature optimization risk. Um, so I hope I've sort of answered some of that because there's, there's definitely a difference between incidence, which is actually the occurrence of the cases and the risk that we're projecting when we're thinking about these sort of ecophysiological models on the climate, on the landscape. Um, so I'm happy to I'm happy to take follow up questions on that if needed. I have a yeah. okay. Thank you, Ken. Go yes, ahead. Uh, 
in reference to an earlier question, which was, how do you get people, whatever that means, to act on your scientific findings? I think it's, it's, a, it's a more subtle question because you're in the favored position where the technical decision makers, the government, is actually coming to you asking for you to give them your data, which you generate. <clears throat> and then the problem is up to them to implement uh, the consequences of your data. And if you think about it, it's exactly what we face uh, with wearing masks at the current time. Uh, it's hard to get people to follow the science. And that's a real challenge, I would say, for people in government. I mean, scientists need to get out and talk. But I think, I think our public leaders are the people who have to generate uh, the willingness on the part of the public to uh, do, to act according to what the scientists are telling them. I agree. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I think it's also it is also sort of on on the shoulders of people like me who are doing this type of science that if we write it responsibly, we shouldn't say. And if I do the science, then action will happen. Um, I heard a, a really interesting uh, talk the other day about implementation science, which is the study of how the research becomes implemented and whether it's successful. And it was just this shocking stat about how you know research gets published and about you know twenty percent of it ever goes to the intended recipient to do an implementation of it. And so I you know I'm I'm trying. A little bit to sort of get outside of my comfort zone, as it were, to meet stakeholders. And so one of, you know, and, and learning about how to think about this from the perspective of, you know, who's going to then do something is really exciting because it means I can know things like, you know, when we when we show up on one of these short-term contracts in the Caribbean, where, you know, we're being paid to help, essentially. I always want to go to the vector control people and say, what time of year do you make your budget decisions? When do you decide how many people are going to be your vector control agents that year? You know, who does payroll, essentially? How do you decide which chemicals to buy? Do you need to know three months ahead that you're going to need to get out there and spray in certain places? Or do you just need to know that you need to spray this year? You know, what, what are those decisions and what scale do they happen at? And does that, you know, how does that information feed into the kinds of decisions on the ground? And it's been it's been very interesting, sort of coming from you know learning theoretical ecology questions to really diving into what is the implementation side. And so once we can think about the implementation side, we can say, okay, who are the decision makers about allocating the resources to people who can make decisions? And that's where you start to touch onto that public policy angle of things and think about what is the documentation. You know, which government documents control even that part of things? Whose ministry is this? Um, and that's been, that's been a learning experience and hopefully one that we can sort of flip back into the classroom earlier in other people's experience. So as we get the next generation going on this, we can streamline the process. I have a, a question from Bob Bernstein to, uh, to you, Sadie. It says, how big a factor in transmission is people's behavior? Oh gosh, <laughs> again, that is, a, that is an issue and a question that hits at multiple scales, right? So, you know, as, as collective decision makers, when we're thinking about, you know, are we, are we the ones making decisions about climate change? You know, the decisions I can make every day are, you know, all, all, the, all the normal sort of recipes, don't eat so much meat, you know, don't, don't drive that really gas guzzling car, but, as an investor, for example, if I look at, you know, so where is my retirement account invested? Are those companies thinking about fossil fuel dependencies? You know, so what, what are the decisions that I as a citizen can make as part of the collective citizenry to impact climate change? And that's a very different question than, you know, am I going to clean up the bromeliads around my house to make sure they're not generating mosquitoes to bite my neighbors? Right? 
So that's, you know, so there's very, there's very different scales at which human behavior really is impacting transmission. Um, and so I'd say, yes, we play a huge role in our sort of peri-domestic zone. So it is good neighborly behavior to clear up your containers for breeding if you live in a place where you know that mosquitoes can breed, which here we are, right? Um, it is neighborly to think about neighborhood cleanup efforts. If there's, you know, if people say, you know, let's, let's go out and pick up trash together. If you think of it as that will also stop the mosquitoes biting everyone. Yes, that's a great reason to go and pick up trash, not just because it looks nice. Um, <laughs> And thinking about sort of when when we have you know local local politics, how do any of those local politics play into being able to think about transmission and giving people the right bits of information and education about what to do about transmission? So, you know, is is spraying yourself with bug spray before you go on a walk a good idea? Probably. Right? Is thinking about checking yourself for ticks when you come back in a good idea? Yes. You know, sort of all these small small things we can do on a personal level do impact transmission. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope I've touched on on a few answers to that question. Julianne, I don't see a hand raised here, and um, I scrolled through. I don't see any hands raised um, on our Zoom visitors. Do you have anybody in the audience? Um, I don't have any questions from the audience. Okay. Well, Stady, I want to say thank you very much for your presentation. You've given us a lot to think about, um, and a lot more understanding, a better understanding of how all these kinds of decisions come about. And it's just not, as you say, tip and toss. It's a lot of other kinds of things going on. I thought it was fascinating, your data on the worldwide temperature business and the aspect of um, the two curves of how that was a right-hand curve with a severe drop. So again, thank you so much for your presentation and your time today. I really appreciate it. And I think everyone else did. If we could all applaud, you would hear that right now. Um, well, thank you very, next, very much for having me. Oh, I'm glad we were actually able to work it out. Me if too. I remember correctly, when we were trying to do this last spring, you were on grand jury duty, and it was iffy as to yeah. whether you were going to be able to be a part of this. So good things Thank worked out in the end. <laughs> Next week, we will have Dr. James Jones, who is a retired um, professor emeritus, uh, speaking about agriculture and um, food supply. So uh, we'll see you all next week, 1.30 on Tuesday afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Sadie. You. Thank you all. Stay well. Thank you.